Well, this is a bittersweet Sunday. Sweet for some because this is the last time this year you'll have to hear me. And bitter, I don't know why it's bitter. Thank you so much for being here this morning. We assume that many out of town But we're glad you are here with us. Now for how many of us, this day, which is only two days away from Tuesday, that's the first of the year, Seth. Uh, well, Seth is looking at me like, huh? How many of you really feel that how did we get here so quickly? Am I the only one? I thought it was only March. I've heard it said years ago, the older you get, the faster time moves. I think we're surprised that we're already here. But now that we are here, this gives us an occasion. God gives us an occasion. And you know, my, my inclination was to go back and look at the new year for Israel and so on, but I just felt the Lord change that inclination. But we had the opportunity of looking toward 2019 and having particular hopes in mind. I'm hoping this new year will and whatever it would be. I'm hoping for whatever it would be. And so probably many of us, maybe not all, you have formulated in your mind some kind of an idea, some kind of a situation, some kind of a circumstance, relationship for which you have hope for 2017. Now, as you know, hope has to do with what we desire, what we expect. And hope always has a goal. Is anyone hoping for nothing? There's always a goal connected with our hope. Always an object of our hope. And so just take a moment wherever you are. And you'll see that I did not put notes on the notes today. It's just a bunch of lines. Because I just felt that sometimes our notes get in the way and sometimes they're helpful. I know, you know, I think both ways about that. But as you listen, the Holy Spirit is going to be saying particular things to you and emphasizing things and bringing to your mind and remembrance. And so every time we teach or preach the Word of God in this church, you should always have a pen in your hand and that paper ready to write. What are you hoping for this year? Just jot down a little something. I know you have hopes. There may be an illness in your family and you're hoping. There may be a relationship that you were involved with and you have hopes for it. There may be a work-related issue. You have hopes. We all have hopes. And so this is that particular time of the year when this issue of hoping for something, putting our desire and expectation in something that is coming so we hope in a particular way. And I would assume that we are hoping for something good. I would assume that. Now, look at your hopes. 
And the interesting thing about hope is that hope has the power to alter our lives or to order our lives in a particular way. And so it is very, very important that our hopes, because they impact our lives today and have the potential of impacting our lives for eternity. The goal of our hope has the power, the ability to impact our daily lives today and for this new year and also for eternity. So we have to be very careful for which we hope. If our hopes are grounded, and I want you to remember that word and maybe write it down. If my hope is grounded, in other words, the foundation, the substance, the most important thing. If my hope is grounded in the things of this world, in the things of this earth, in those things which pertain to natural life, If that's where my hope is, then that's going to impact my life. And the result of that will not only impact me today, but will also have eternal consequences. And we will experience great loss perhaps today, but at least for eternity. But you see, if our hopes are grounded in God's purpose, if our hope is in concert with God's eternal goal for our lives, we're going to experience great spiritual gain both now and in eternity. So it's important. It's important. that we look at 2019 and we look at all those things that we're hoping for, all those aspirations, all those goals, and to make sure that as best we can, being led by the Holy Spirit, to be sure that all of these goals and hopes for this next year, next year are in concert with God's great goal for our lives as his people. Now, this means that we need to evaluate each of our hopes and asking them, are these hopes in line with God's great goal? So what is God's goal for us? Well, God's goal very simply can be said this way. God's goal for his people is the gospel. The gospel. Now, you may say, well, I've heard that a lot, but that's no news. But here's the weakness. If I were to ask and walk down and point to somebody and ask you to come up here take the microphone and give us a definition of the gospel. Could you do that? Could you define the basic elements of the gospel? Because if you cannot, then you see you're going to be impaired in achieving or walking in God's goal for your life. So what's the gospel? Well, let me read to you what I have here, and maybe you'll take notes on this, maybe you won't, and I'll read it slowly. Now, the gospel can be described in various ways, but it needs to have particular elements. So, the gospel is the good news that God has forgiven our sin through the atoning death of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel is the good news that God has forgiven our sin 
through the atoning death of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and has given us eternal life in the resurrection of his son, which we receive by faith. And has given us eternal life in the resurrection of his son, which we receive by faith. So one of the verses that you might be familiar with is Ephesians 2, verse 8. Who can quote Ephesians 2, 8? Stand up. Somebody stand up and tell me what Ephesians 2, 8. Go ahead. Loud so I can hear you. I can't hear. So if you don't know Ephesians 2, 8, you need to learn Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. So God's goal for us is the gospel. Now that being the case, that means that we must know what the gospel is and the various elements of the gospel. Which has to do as Barbara Mueller stood up this morning and talked about learning the word of God. This is what Paul in Romans 1.1 1, 1 says as he describes himself. He says, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. So what does that mean? Because if we're not careful, when we think about the gospel or when we want to share about the gospel, too often... The word I, my, and me is central to the discussion or the description. And that's not correct. I am in the gospel, but secondarily. This is called the gospel of God. So that means this, that the gospel is from God. The gospel is for God. And the gospel is about God. So anytime someone is asking what you believe and you share the gospel, always make God the central aspect, the centerpiece of the gospel. Who he is, what he has done, why we have needed this, and how we are experiencing it today. And then in verses 16 and 17, you remember Romans 1, 16 and 17? How many of you, not you, Donnie, you're strange. <laughs> Judy has told us that for years. Some of you don't know Donnie Bourgeois, do you? Who can stand and quote, not read it, quote Romans 16 and 17, 1, 16 and 17? Somebody Go ahead, don't be shy. Somebody stand and quote Romans 1, 16 and 17. No, no, give us the first two words, for I. No, 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 not unless you stand up. Now, you're not reading it, are you, Nick? Now stand up and yell it out so these people can hear you. In verse 17, Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to get the tape and see if I just said 16. Verse 16, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it is a dunamis, the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew and also for the gent in other words, for everybody who believes. But what does verse 17 say? You see, because verse 17 says something about the description or the content of the gospel. Burtis, do you know verse 17 by heart? Who? Who knows verse 17 by heart? For in it, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is what? Revealed from what? I can't hear you. From faith to faith. That's Todd, huh? Troy, I see you. I got the T right. Hello. I've done it this way. I know this is not the typical way of we do things. It's too bad. But it's the way I do things. 
I was a school teacher for too many years and I know something. I know that if there's not encouragement and involvement, we ain't gonna learn stuff. Now, Bill Treby will tell you this, and Phil Widener will agree with him, and so will Frank. These verses that we just quoted are fundamental. Right, Phil? These are not sideline verses. These are central to our understanding. So if you were sitting here, well, I don't know about that. Brothers and sisters, if you name the name of the Lord Jesus as your Savior, you need to do a whole lot better in knowing the Word of God. Can all of you say amen? amen. Now, some of you may say, well, I was just shy. Well, okay. Now, specifically, Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And then Romans 1.17, for in it, in the gospel, the righteousness of God is displayed, is revealed. Specifically, what is it about the gospel that is being displayed before all humanity? Romans 8.29. <laughs> Anybody can quote Romans 8, 29. See, had some of you been in school, of, no, not now, it's too late, you missed it. You're good, I like you. I knew you knew it for a reason. So what does Romans 8, 29 say? We have been predestined by God to be what? Conform to the image of his son. So what is the essence of the gospel? Why has God, Todd, done all that he's done? He's done everything he's done for us and in us for one purpose, so that the glory of God, who he is in himself and how he is in himself, his nature and his character, as displayed fully and perfectly in his son. Colossians 1.15, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. That the glory of God the Father displayed in God the Son, in his humanity, in Jesus Christ, may now be seen and displayed in his people who have been created in the image of Christ. Amen? You see, all of this is about one goal for God. We have been saved for one great purpose. So that in my life and in your life, my life and your life, in every aspect and every category, says something about the glory of God's Son. Correct? That's what God's after. In any and every category, God is after one thing, primarily, centrally, that his son be magnified and glorified and declared as great through my life and your life. That's the gospel, Johnny, right? That's the gospel, brother. Dan, that's the gospel. What's your name again? Kyle, what's your name? Kyle. This is what Paul calls the hope of the gospel. So let's go back. I take all of my hopes for 2019. And I put them together. And I ask God, do all of these hopes specifically reveal the gospel? Are all my hopes coming together? Are they grounded 
in God's desire for us and purpose for us which is the living display of his son in and among us. Why is this so critical? How has it come alive in us? Well, I've shared this before and I'll do it again. I don't mind repeating myself, by the way. So I can say the same thing twice and not be reiterating. Some of you missed that, I know. <laughs> Probably all of you know, I used to be a school teacher. <laughs> Who would have loved to have had some of you in my classroom? <laughs> all these excuses up here. <laughs> And as you well know, I taught everybody's most favorite class. What was it? Now, how many of you would say English was not your favorite or English is not your favorite subject? How many of you would say that? And I would say you're wrong because I will say this to you. What do you use all day long? English. It's your favorite subject. Come on, come on, come on. It's the study of English that you don't like. Am I right? Nouns and pronouns and adverbs and params, dangling participles, misplaced modifiers, nominative, objective, possessive cases. Whew, man. I mean, Pat, you leaving going to Texas, you in trouble over there, girl? Most people don't know how to speak as we do. They speak correctly. You can't go over there and say, my mom and him. Make something wrong with you. We're going to miss y'all. And you know, a lackadaisical attitude about learning and taking notes until the most powerful three words cross my lips. What are those words? The final exam. Oh, oh, Mr. Davidson, could you repeat what you just said? Could you tell us again? Could you go over it? Could you go more slowly? Now, Pam, why is the final exam so important? Graduation. You don't want to be the last in the class, as Eddie was. I mean, uh, uh, you don't want to be the last in the class. Why is graduation so important, Sam? Because it will determine the kind of life that you have, depending on what you learn, your grades and everything, and your future, etc., right? The life that you will live in this world, correct? You see, it has consequences that are beyond the immediate activity. Why is this important? Why is it important that our hopes for 2019 are in concert with the gospel of God? Listen to this verse. Yes, you may take it down as a reference. Acts 17, 31. Paul is speaking to the folks on what is called the Areopagus on Mars Hill in Athens, Georgia. I mean, Athens, Greece. And he says this, talking about this God who is represented by this unknown God statue. He says, this God, listen carefully, has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness. The next time you begin or continue to read the epistles, you know, those are the letters of the New Testament. I want you to notice how often that day, the day that Jesus returns and judges his church, I want you to notice how often that day is mentioned that underpins the teaching 
For instance, I'll just give you this hint. First Thessalonians is Paul's early letter to a church. And each of the five chapters, Paul ends each of the five chapters about Jesus, in relation to Jesus' return and the judgment. First John does this. The Apostle Peter does this. It's standard apostolic teaching to emphasize for the church because we need encouragement. The students in my class needed encouragement. This is on the final. And what we're saying is this. The goals of our hopes for 2019 and the way we live in 2019 as it also pertained to 18 and 17 and whatever. Way, the way we live in this day will impact directly that day. This day is but a preparation for that day. High school years were but a preparation for graduation to be living as an adult. We need to remember this because there are far too many in the church who live oblivious or ignoring that day. And you say, wow, don't say that. That bothers me. That upsets me. Well, it needs to. If it upsets you, if it excites you, great. If it upsets you or makes you nervous and whatever, then that is the Holy Spirit saying something to you about the way you're living today. And I don't say you as excluding me. I say you all including me. I'm just like everybody else. I have my issues. I'm not yet perfected. There's just still one more thing I need to work on to be perfect. And you can ask my wife about that. A very big one thing. No. You see, knowing this, Paul knows that if our lives are not grounded in the hope of the gospel... If your hopes for 2019, if my hopes for 2019 are not grounded in and for the purpose of God in the gospel, which is the revelation of his son in my life, if that's not the focal point, the hub of every hope, He knows that Paul knows that we can easily, as he says in Colossians, be shifted from the gospel and we will suffer loss. We'll be shifted from the gospel. You see, believers, don't think that just because you're a believer and know something about Jesus that everything's going to be fine. The Bible doesn't say that. And you don't want, if your life has been shifting from the gospel during these last years, then confess that to God and ask him that beginning this new year and continuing that those things that have shifted you from the gospel no longer will shift you. Why? Because one day there is coming a final exam. And maybe all of us, I believe all of us to some extent, and maybe some to a greater extent, should if I ask this question, who right now is absolutely
absolutely ready before the Lord to stand before the Lord and let him judge anything and everything of your life because everything is so great. Remember Abraham? Who is Abraham? Abraham is the quintessential man of faith in the Old Testament. In Genesis 15, Abraham says to the Lord, hey, how will I know that I'm going to have a son? And God says, hey, go outside and look at the stars. And Abraham saw these stars and the Lord says, so shall your descendants be. And Abraham believed God and it was credited credited or accounted to him as what righteousness in other words Abraham's faith was grounded in God's purpose and so listen to what Romans 4 18 and 19 says about Abraham in hope he believed that he should become the father of many nations as he had been told by God so shall your offspring be he did not weaken in faith. Why? Because his hope was in God when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead. I mean, Abraham's about 100 years old at this time. We're a little, 99, you know, this is a little bit of time before Genesis 18. He's an old dude. He can't have any more kids. His wife is barren. She ain't had no kids all these years and now all of a sudden as an old lady she's going to have kids? It's impossible. It's stupid. It's ridiculous. But you see Abraham's hope was grounded in the gospel. Why do I say that? Because Paul says in Galatians 3.8 that the scripture testifies that the gospel was preached to Abraham beforehand. In other words, God's presence and person and work and promise was the activity of the gospel in the Old Testament to be fully declared and manifested in the incarnation of his son, Jesus Christ. And as a consequence, Hebrews 6.15 says this, because Abraham's hope was set in the goal of God, in the gospel of God, Hebrews 6.15 says this, after waiting patiently, what? With his hope grounded in God, in the gospel, Abraham received what was promised. So what do we say? As a result, Abraham's life was sustained and was blessed as he placed his hope in the content and effect of the gospel of God. Why? Because his decisions and his actions were ordered and defined by the gospel, by God's purpose to manifest his son in Abraham. Now, did Abraham, Steve, do it perfectly? No. And when he missed it, he confessed. And God gave him repentance. And Abraham continued to move forward. And so what great favor did God give to Abraham? What great title did God give to Abraham? Say it, somebody said it. Who said that? Just say it loud. God called Abraham my friend. And Jesus says years later to the disciples, you are my friends if you do what I command you. What a blessing to be called and recognized as the friend of God, to be declared a man of righteousness. He's the example of a man of faith in the Old Testament. And in fact, this declaration that 
Abraham's faith was credited to him as righteousness is repeated in Romans, in Hebrews, and twice in 2 John, four times. I'm sorry, 1 John, four times. Sorry, James. Did I miss James? Help me to get this right, somebody. I missed my point. Galatians, Romans, James, and Hebrews. I was thinking of another passage. Four times. If Abraham were here today, if after whatever, 4,000 or whatever years, the Lord would cause Abraham to appear before us today. What do you think his message would be to us for 2019? Be critically sure that what your hope is set on is in concert with and based in and grounded in the gospel. Because he'll tell you, and I think we've already discerned this in the beginning of the service today, time passes very quickly. And all of these things and relationships and pursuits that we pursue for ourselves apart from a recognition or even a concern about the issue of reflecting God's son will pass by and then there's a day of reckoning when we have to give an account of that. And Abraham would say, make it the gospel. Make it the gospel. Why? Why? Listen to this word, 1 Corinthians 3, 12 to 15. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation, which is the gospel of Christ, with gold and silver and precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble, all kinds of works, each one's work will become manifested for the day. What day? The day of judgment. For the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what short sort of work each one has done. The fire, the Holy Spirit. This is not a purgatory fire as others teach. This has nothing to do with purgatory. It has everything to do with the evaluation of our works in reference to the gospel, in reference to God's purpose for my life, in reference to being the goal and the object of my hopes. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation, on Christ, on the gospel, if it survives, if it survives this evaluation of the flaming purity and purging work of the Holy Spirit, of the Lord Jesus, of God himself. If it survives that, that person will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, she will suffer loss, though he or she himself will be saved, but only as through fire. You see, this is not a passage that has to do with your salvation. This is a passage that has to do with the kind of life you lived as a believer. So you see that final exam, that final exam. On that final exam, my life, your life, my goals, the objects of my hope will be revealed and tested. And on that day, we're going to find out whether we made some very big mistakes. Because what's generally happening, I don't believe, well, I can't say for everyone, but for the most part, I believe that this church, that the members of this church, for the most part, some exceptions, are not purposefully seeking to live contrary 
to the gospel. I don't believe that. I believe that for the most part, we are a church that is seeking to live according to God's gospel. But where are we missing it? Where we are missing it, you see, I don't want, as a pastor, I don't want you to stand before the Lord one day and suffer great loss. And knowing that the great possibility and even probability for many, I'm going to warn. I'm going to say something. You see, if I were your child's English teacher and your son or daughter was not doing well or in New Orleans, you weren't doing good. And you weren't doing well. Well's an adverb, good's an adjective. <laughs> I know that's a, wow, I didn't know that. Darby, you got that? You wrote that down? And if your son or daughter ain't doing good, oh, that's what he said, now I got it. <laughs> How many of you would appreciate me as a teacher not letting you know how your child was doing? Or how many of you would want me to get on your child appropriately to encourage and correct and do whatever I needed to to get that child of yours to do as good a job as he or she could? Wouldn't you want me to do that? Yes or no? Do you care about your children, your grandchildren? Yes! Oh, God, he cares about us. And that's why we say what we do. That's why we come up sometimes and confront people and speak to them. Maybe not in the most diplomatic way, but who cares about the diplomacy when your life is on the line as to its result in heaven? The important thing is That we live a life where all of our hopes and aspirations and desires and motives are constantly, continually, regularly submitted to the Holy Spirit. I can't tell you, and maybe I'll get, somebody's going to get upset about this, but I don't care. I can't tell you how many times I have heard this. Well, God doesn't care about. Jesus says God cares about every hair on your head. He cares about every sparrow that falls to the ground. How dare you say that there's something about your life or decisions and you say, well, God doesn't care what I do about that or it's not important. What kind of a God are you talking about? The God who sent his son to the cross? God cares about every beat of my heart, every breath of my uh, lungs, every blink of my eye. God cares. You see... 2 Corinthians 5.10. Write it down. The apostle says, for we all. Now, James, whom is he talking to? 2 Corinthians, he's talking to the church, right? Paul is talking to believers in Jesus Christ. Don't dismiss these things and be such a fool. For we, who's we? Usins, the church. Paul, the apostle, and all the other members of the church. For we all must. Did you just hear me, Johnny? I can't hear you, brother. Did you just hear what I said? What word did I use? Must. Daniel, was that you back there? For we all, how many? What's the next word? Must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. In 
order that each one of us may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Now, does that mean, Floyd, that a believer can do evil? Yes. And what is the evil? Here's the evil. Make sure you get this. Whew. Make sure you get this. What is the evil, Chris? The evil is there whatever in my life that lies about the Son of God. You lie about my grandchildren. That's evil. The evil is whatever is done, said, thought, desired, motivated, whatever, that in any way is against the Son of God. In other words, those actions and motivations which are not engendered by and empowered by and led by the Holy Spirit. So I make decisions on my own. I go where I want to go. I act the way I want to act. I buy what I want to buy. I look at what I want to look at because I'm free. You in bondage. Freedom is listening to and submitting to the work of the Holy Spirit as we are conformed to Christ. That's God's goal. So on the day of judgment, what will be the basis of God's judging every single person who sits in this room? Some who sit in this room, you may not be a believer. That's not good news. Because on that day, those who have not received Christ as their Savior and have received the forgiveness and the blessing of God who have not called upon the Lord Jesus to save them, who've not done that, but you've relied on something else, the Bible says you will be cast away from God forever. But for the rest, who have received the gift of eternal life in Christ by faith, we're going to be judged, church. There's a judgment coming. I believe that's going to be the most sobering day, Steve, of my life and of your life. Mike, I believe that will be a sobering day. I don't think there'll be any giggling and silliness and all of that. That will be a day that will be a mixture of sobriety and great joy to enter heaven. So the basis of God's judgment will be Romans 8.29. What is Romans 8, 29? For God has saved us for this purpose, that we be predestined to be conformed to the image of his own son. You have to remember these verses. So let's, let's ask some questions about our hopes for 2019. And yes, you may write these down if you would like. For married people, how many of you are married in here? For married people, what will my marriage say about God's son? In 2019, what will my marriage say about God's son? For instance, Ephesians 22, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. What does that say about Jesus? He submitted to the Father's will. So the way you relate to your husband and help him and submit to him and follow him and respect him has a, has a direct bearing on revealing the image of God's son. So when you don't, what you're saying is Jesus did not. And God ain't going to take it light. Husbands, 
Verse 25, Ephesians 5, 25. Love your wives just in the same way as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Husbands, the way we love and lead our wives is to be a direct and clear and compelling revelation of how the Son of God loves his church and leads his church for the glory of God. And the way we conduct ourselves within the context of living out God's kind of love for our wives. And if you don't know what that is, Galatians 5, 22 and 23 will help you. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8 will help you. And the way we do that is a display of God's son. We're going to be judged. Your attitude about your wife, your thoughts about her, your disappointments about her. Wives, the way you relate to your husbands in a way, it's all going to be revealed. Let's make our goal for 2019 that in my marriage, God's son will be more clearly, compellingly, consistently displayed. What will my time in the scriptures in 2019 say about God's son? If we were to look at your involvement in the scriptures, could it be said that you really have made, or have rather uh, acknowledged Jesus as your Savior and Lord, and that you're under his leadership, that he is the most important person in your life? The way we handle the scriptures Say something about the Son of God. Why? Why? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And then in verse 14, and the Word became a man. And we beheld His glory, that glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. It's about the Son of God. What about my personal purity? Mm. Mm. My personal thoughts and desires. What do my thoughts and desires say about the Son of God? Nobody knows except the most important person. And it's going to be revealed on that day. And you're going to suffer loss. I will suffer loss. All I'm doing today by the Spirit's leading, hopefully, is making us aware of things. We're not dealing with how to deal with all this because I don't mind doing that. But you're going to want to go home and watch some game. If everybody wants to stay here, just say so and we'll shut the doors and leave. I'm, I'm fine for the whole day. You don't believe me, do you? I'm fine for the whole day. But we're not going to do that. Maybe the elders need to redo these services a little bit. What will my relationships with others in 2019 say about God's son? Now think about it. Stop. You know, there's just, unfortunately, there's a whole lot of folks who are not here. I understand they're out of town. But thems who are not here, for whatever reason, very, very, very unfortunately, do not listen to the podcast, too many of them, of these services. God speaks to us. Can you say amen? God is in here speaking to us. That's just not a bunch of guys up here saying something. in this congregation today. I know. I've met with many of you. I know. Shall I begin to describe some things? 
You've been in my office. You've been in Keith's office, Evan's office, Ronald's office. You met with Bill Treby. You met with Phil Widener. You met with Frank. We know you. And their relationships. <laughs> On that day, what will your relationship be with that? Mm -hmm. What will it say about God's son? For the sake of the gospel, let's stop it and correct it. What is my career saying about God's son? What do you mean my career? This is what I do. I mean, Treby and Widener will remember years ago, we're sitting in an elder, a board meeting. I know elders by then, right, Bill? 1989. And we're sitting in there. And Bo Nicholson, who is the youth pastor of the church, takes another church. Remember that, Bill? And we're discussing what to do, whom to, with whom to replace him. Do you remember that, Phil? And Tommy Ploche, one of the elders at the time, pipes up and he says, Peter Davidson, you can take his place. What? What, what do you, I own a business. I'm a businessman. I own a printing company. How in the world can I do that? Come on, man. I'm a businessman. I have a career. Certainly, Mo, God isn't going to interfere with it. There was nothing wrong with it, nothing ungodly about it. Sometimes I did think a few ungodly things about these printing presses, I can tell you that. <laughs> God stuck his hand right in the middle of my business. And of course, Mike Indes, the pastor, comes up with these foolish words. Will you pray? Oh, great. Frank, where are you? Frank, are you in here? Help me, brother. Will I pray? Well, certainly I'm not going to pray. I'm a man of God. I don't have to pray. I know. Uh, no, don't laugh. No, no, no. Too many, that's where you are. I know. I don't have to pray. Steve, you were in that meeting too, I think, weren't you? You were sleeping. I remember, yeah. You, you know, Steve, I don't have to pray. I'm a man of God. I know. Chris, I know. I don't have to pray. The linchpin is your career. What is it going to say about the Son of God in 2019? Man, now what the man's doing, he's messing us up. Yes. What about my, the time I spend in prayer? What will we say about God's son? Can we say that we truly love and adore and fellowship and enjoy God given the amount of prayer? And I don't mean praying during the day. I'm talking about setting aside periods of time every day as best we can. What about my time in attending Sunday services? Oh, thank God I was here today. Whew. Well, you see, you're here today. That means, Ed, that Eddie, for the next seven Sundays, you don't have to be here because you're here today. That's how half the, too many of the people think in this church. I got it here today. I don't have to come back for a couple, three weeks. What is saying about God's son? Do you understand why this bothers me? Can anybody say amen? It bothers me for the sake of of the gospel. You being here one way or the other has nothing to do with me personally. I go somewhere else to church. It has something to say about the greatest person of our life. How often do we make this assembly something of less significance than it is to God? So the first thing out of Jesus' mouth, do you mind if I go a little bit? Can anybody give me 15 minutes? Can anybody raise your hand? Give me 15 minutes. I have four hours. Okay. Now, I just multiply. I'm, I'm, I'm a math major. <clears throat> the first thing out of Jesus' mouth on the day of resurrection was this. After he tells Mary, don't touch me. What is the first thing? I'm going to church. I'm going to Galilee. Get the guys together. We're having church Sunday night. Can you say amen? This is the heart of God for us to be here. And you're going to love this one. <laughs> what does my giving, money, honey, 
What does my giving say about the Son of God? There are many of you who almost give nothing. There are many of you who give a few pence here and there. And there are a few of you who give what God has said he wants to honor him, the tithe. That's not, Lester, I didn't make this up. This ain't my words. This isn't a way for preachers to make money. It's about the Son of God. What in the world is our giving and the reason and the attitude for doing what we're doing or not doing what we do? What are you going to hear on the day of judgment? That day is coming. Can you say amen? There's a great danger. There's going to be a great loss. But I can tell you one thing. It won't be on my credit. I've told you. You leave here today. Man, that guy's nuts. And I'm still going to do this. Do what you do. But we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ. To receive what is done in the body the deeds that are done in the body, whether they are good, reflecting Christ, or evil, lying about the Son of God. Does my giving say that Jesus is God's gift? And does it display it in a magnificent way? Today is the day for us to decide to make the gospel of God our one consuming hope for 2019 and following. Today is the day. What's going to happen is this. You're going to leave here today and that slimy, slippering serpent is going to do everything he can according to John 10.10. 10. For the thief cometh but what? Kill, steal, and destroy. Ah, but be of good cheer, for I, Jesus said, have overcome the world. Satan is going to try to steal anything and everything you've heard today. And you're going, here's how he's going to do it. You're going to begin to rationalize rather than ask the Holy Spirit. You're going to rationalize rather than ask the Holy Spirit. You're going to rationalize rather than ask the Holy Spirit. And then most of it, you don't even have to ask the Holy Spirit because where is it anyway? In the Word of God. Don't be like this. For us who are here and for those who will listen on whatever they call these things, CDs or whatever, let's make this year the year of God's greater triumph and death of the victory that we serve a risen, ruling, returning man from heaven. Amen? So I'll end this way. <clears throat> so we hope you have a happy new year. Esperamos que tangas un feliz año nuevo. T take it away. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and stand up respond to God's word to us placing our hope in him as we sing my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus blood and righteousness I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly lean on Jesus name on Christ the solid rock I stand all other ground is sinking sand all other ground is sinking sand darkness darkness hides his lovely face I rest on his unchanging 
This way, Lord, to live this year, this start of a fresh year, Lord, a, an opportunity for us as your people to reconsider what it is that we're building our lives upon. Lord, are we building our lives on the hope of the gospel, on pleasing the God who has saved us? Is that what we're doing? Lord, help us to ask difficult questions of ourselves. Lord, help us by giving us by giving us the help and the grace and the mercy that we need, Lord, to hear the answers to those questions, Lord, and to make, um, to make movement, to make intentions, uh, Lord, that are going to please you, Lord, to change things about our lives, Lord, that need to change, Lord, so we might bring you greater glory, that we might be more faithful Christians, Lord, change us, Lord, help us to not dismiss this word. Or may we take it home with us and plan for this year. Not planning with our own strength, Lord. We need you. Lord, Holy Spirit, we need your help in this. Lord, so come and help us, we pray. Lord, and we look forward to that day where we will be standing with you. Our hope is that we will be found in you. We'll be dressed in your righteousness alone. And you will see us as faultless because of your son, Jesus. Lord, and Lord, what hope that gives us where we place our trust. We don't place our trust in our own ability, but we place it in your infinite ability. And we love you, God. In your name we pray. Amen.